uh, we'll kick things off uh, with Maria. We'll ask her, if I'm a first-time startup founder, one of the questions that I'm struggling with is deciding what the differences, the nuanced differences between VCs and angels is, and which one do I go to and when. Can you give us some insight as to how a founder might think through which path to choose, if you will? Sure. Well, you can think about your fundraising path as a continuum with your first stop being friends and family. And your second stop is angels. And then your third step would be VC. So um, angel groups and super angels and angel investors look to fund companies that are in their seed stage, which means very early. So some angel groups invest with a PowerPoint and an idea. Some might want you to have the product, but everyone will have their different criteria. So it's not a one size fits all model. Um, when you're moving forward into VC, they're going to want to see some more traction, more metrics, a, a product, um, and they'll be evaluating you based on some different metrics than you, they may as an angel. And I think one thing that's important to establish is, you know, from a baseline level, is venture capital even the right route for you? Um, there's a lot of different ways to capitalize your business, and, uh, and you know, VCs are ones that take ownership, and they take board seats, and they kind of push you around to, <laughs> to tell you exactly what they want, and, it, you know, incentives aren't always aligned. So um, I think, you know, before even saying, okay, I'm making the transition from angel to VC, um, is that the right route for your business? And there's a couple of, you know, ways to really navigate that, but there are other options uh, besides venture dollars. So, so something that's uh, also important to consider. I think that's a really good point to understand if you have an investable company. You could run a great startup, a great company um, with no venture capital. If you want a $10 million business, for instance, that'll put a lot of money in your pocket and that would be success for you. But for a VC, I need to think that you can make me 10 times my money at least. So five to 10 times your money, usually that's what angels are looking for. So I have to believe that if I give you this check, like you're gonna make $100 million or a billion dollars. I think that's also um, kind of the differences between angels' expectations for entrepreneurs and VC expectations, but also just understand wh what kind of life do you wanna live? Do you want to be on the leash of a VC who's controlling you or are you fine making your you know, $10 million a year, You know running your business. So um, it's really what you guys want to think before, to think about that before you go out, you know, to raise money. Yeah, frankly, I, I, I would say that as an angel, I probably prefer financially for a VC never to get involved because I'm, I'm probably going to get uh, you know, crammed down and diluted. And um, But look, uh, I, I'm, I'm neutral on VCs at the end of the day. It's just... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Neutral, oh my. Um, but uh, the, the, the hard part to model is just how much dilution to expect going forward. And, and no matter how much I negotiate on the front end, uh, uh, often the practical situation going forward means that a lot of the things I negotiate for will kind of just get swept under the rug as part of that next raise. So just things to think about going forward. Um, I think my, my if I model my upside correctly, it's probably going to be better if VCs never get involved. But if VCs never get involved, you may not have enough money to, yeah, get exactly. your to grow it's your company. Yeah. So, yeah. VCs have a, a preference not to deal with angels as well. They'll buy out your initial investor uh, group uh, as well. Isn't, isn't that right? It's all about a clean cap table. <laughs> right, right. Um, over the last 10 years that I've been a part of a uh, startup scene, I've seen angel and rounds in general, sort of balloon up. Um, it was pretty common uh, 10, 15 years ago for somebody to raise 10, 25, 50K from an angel um, or a pre-seed round. Now these numbers are going up and up. Now pre-seeds go up to like 500 or whatever. Uh, there are certain outliers. What are you guys, all three of you, you can chime in. What are you seeing on the ground? What are, what's the size of that initial investment these days? I mean, I, I typically see raises in the half a million to $2 million range at, at pre-money valuations of you know, three to 10 million. Um, and that's just anecdotal. Um, 
you can see outliers on, on both both sides. Right. So um, it's typically what I see. Okay. And I see the same, but I also find differences in regional in regions. So on the coast, you'll see the valuations yeah. that Samir pointed out, but in the middle and in the south, you'll see lower valuations. So you'll right. see free money that's like two million to maybe four million. Yeah. So it really depends on geography. And so if you're out raising money, and if you think that you your company deserves a little bit of a higher valuation, you know, pre-revenue, then that's something that you want to think about when you're going to raise money. If you're going to raise um, in New York or San Francisco. Yeah, yeah I think there's a couple big factors when deciding how much to raise. And one thing is to be really aware of the market optics, um, which is even if you call it a seed and it's a pre-seed or you want to call it a series A, you know, those titles are really just titles, but it does signal to your investors um, what stage of the company you're at, right? So if you're raising a, an angel round, you're absolutely correct. Over the past decade, there's been a huge evolution in the size of, you know, really what should that be? Um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, are you a, a healthcare business that needs to go through FDA approval or you a, um, you know, an enterprise SaaS where you just need to, you know, build out that MVP and can start generating revenue from there. It's highly dependent on, you know, sort of what is the trajectory of the business look like. But going back to your earlier point, when you're raising today, you're thinking about, even if it's an angel round, you're thinking about, okay, how is this going to impact my series A, my series B, my series D, if you do choose to go down the venture route. So 150K. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, one of the uh, hard things for founders to do is to get at-bats with investors. Uh, it's all about at-bats. Um, investors receive dozens, perhaps, founders per day, consider dozens of investments, perhaps more, depending on the size of the firm or whoever's in charge, I suppose. Um, but founders rarely speak with investors, and there's a certain power disparity there, the knowing. So one of the difficult things for us, Haley, is getting those at-bats mm -hmm. with investors. Yeah. So how important is the warm intro? Mm -hmm. um, how can we get more at-bats with investors? How do we get in front of more investors more often? Please speak to that. Yeah. So what this, you know, private equity is fundamentally a relationship driven business. So the largest M&A and IPO deals of all time, I can tell you for a fact, those have not been a result of a cold email. Um, Stephanie Cohen, actually the chief strategy officer of Goldman Sachs, just did um, a great podcast on this, um, on Invest with the Best, which was, you know, her entire career sort of spent uh, negotiating these private deals is I'm not going to touch one unless it was brought to me by someone I've known for a decade. I've done, you know, 20 transactions with them in the past, and I have this sort of element of trust, because when there's billions of dollars on the line and you're getting to that many zeros, um, it's, again, someone who just came in the door yesterday, you might not have that history of saying, okay, we've uh, been around the, been around the, you know, all the block together and know that, you know, when, when, you know, when things hit the fan, we'll all, we'll all still be on the same team, right? right. So I think fundamentally, um, you know, if you don't have a warm intro to an investor and they're your target investor, go through a founder in their portfolio. Having founder friends is, you know, the best thing you can do for yourself because you're, you know, looking, you're, you know, whether you're a, a part of an accelerator or an incubator program and, you know, there's people around for moral support and all suffering through the same pain points. Um, I think there's a lot of way to, a lot of ways to get to investors. And, and some VCs are very different. Some VCs actually do encourage cold outreach. So if you're that kind of person, you know, search, you know, do, do a quick Google search and you'll find the ones that do. Other investors consider it a red flag saying, if you can't get a warm intro to me, how are you going to get to your customer? So, you know, what it all comes down to is saying, okay, you know, when you said at bats. I think that there's a little bit of a misconception with that because just because you're in the room with another investor on the other side of the table does not necessarily mean it's going to be a productive meeting for both people. Because if you're not talking to Samir, who you know is investing in your industry at your stage and they're not going to understand it pretty quickly, then it kind of is a waste of everyone's time. And that's your most precious resource. So being very diligent, uh, truly, about the research you do on um, who the conversation with ahead of time really matters more than the volume of investor conversations that you're having. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the misconceptions? This is for all three of you, if you'd like to chime in. 
Um, what are some of the misconceptions that you've encountered with founders, working with founders? Perhaps their expectations are too high. Perhaps they're too low. Uh, Samir, if you don't mind, let's start with you. I guess I'll say a, a couple of things here. One, um, uh, I, I like to build a relationship with, with the founders. Uh, I, I, I hear a lot of these anecdotes about um, FOMO or fear of missing out, and I have, I'm talking to an investor, I'm going to get X, Y, and Z, and uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't like those kinds of conversations. I, um, uh, I prefer to build a relationship over a longer period of time and, and feel like I'm uh, a, a stakeholder that's invested uh, not only capital but, but more. Um, and then I guess uh, being a financial, you know, coming from the, the, you know, the Wall Street mentality and just thinking about IRR and return and modeling these kinds of investments out, um, just, just keep in mind that um, uh, a lot of the, um, you know, we model, I model uh, that eight or nine of these out of 10 are probably, you know, not going to generate uh, a, a good return, if, if any return. And so, you know, the one or two that's going to have to work out just for the math to work. And, and I think sophisticated investors will allocate just a portion of their, you know, net worth or whatever to this kind of investing. But to make that decision worthwhile from an IRR or rate of return perspective, you, I mean, for the math to work, it's simple math, it's 30 X plus type returns. And so um, try, to, try to get that across is that that's possible, whether it's scalable or, you know, talk to the scalability, the total market that's possible here, and we'll figure out all the rest. But uh, those are the two areas I would, I would focus on. Maria, as a founder, what surprised you in the process of becoming an investor? What well, didn't you expect? Well, I thought that every founder would be proactive because when I'm a founder and I'm out raising money, I'm constantly keeping up with the investors that, I'm in the, that are in my pipeline and I'm giving them updates, I'm alerting them, I'm reaching out to them, I'm sharing good news with them. And what I found that was interesting was I'd invest in a founder, be excited about the partnership, and then they go silent. And I'm you know, reaching out, I'm here to help you. And I, that was kind of a surprise. I thought they would be more proactive in reaching out, and some founders are, but a lot of founders aren't. They just kind of wanted the check and then to be on their way. But when you develop a relationship, you can really be getting more value add from your investors if they're invested you know, with you in a space that they know you should be reaching out to them and they'll be happy to connect you with resources because at the end of the day, we're all on the same team and we all want you to win. Yeah. Uh, Samir, uh, you've invested in 12 startups over the last year and a half. Um, why, how, what compelled you to do that? What stage did you invest in? MVP, idea, prototype. Uh, tell us about your selection process. Yeah, look, uh, so when I um, was a hedge fund investor, I was an event-driven investor. So every, I view every situation as unique. So I don't have a, a theme. I'm, I'm a generalist. So I have to like the underlying market potential and the growth, uh, that, which is completely un, you know, unrelated to anything you can control. And then separately, I have to feel like you know, when I'm meeting with you that you're just committed to it, you're going to uh, have a, um, a good approach to dealing with adversity because there's going to be tons of um, uh, ups and downs, but lots of downs to get through. Um, and uh, for me, uh, to answer your question directly, it's just a, I'm going through a transition. I mean, I, I was a professional investor for a long time, so I'm always going to invest. But this is... Uh, a fun way for me to do it. It's ability to give back and, and, and obviously be involved with like frontier, innovative tech type stuff. It's just super interesting for me and, uh, yeah. and I enjoy it. So, uh, so doing the 12, it could have been 25, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, it could have been five. It's just right. like numbers that, you know, it just, it just happens to be what it is. Numbers guy. You just yeah. saw Haley, what about the uh, thesis <laughs> yes. or your VC firm? Uh, so at Plum Alley, we're actually not an angel stage investment firm. We typically come in at the Series A and B level. 
Um, so we look for companies that operate uh, in the B2B space that are either deep technology or frontier healthcare. Um, and beyond, you know, one of the many criteria that, you know, comes down to sort of an art and a science and so many factors that are kind of hard to pinpoint and, and maybe almost more qualitative, um, is what we look for is, you know, we're fundamentally trying to move the future of technology forward um, and building the future Fortune 500. How do we do that? Um, we believe the best way to do so is with um, teams that are really well-rounded. So we actually look for gender diversity at the founder level. Mm -hmm. So we will only invest in a company, again, sort of want one on these checklists is um, if they have a gender diverse founding team, at least one female co-founder with equal equity representation on the cap table. Mm. And Maria, uh, Sky Views. Uh, Still Sky Ventures. So um, in addition to being a VC, I'm also an angel investor. So I invest with a group called Pipeline Angels and we invest in female and femme um, entrepreneurs and across industries. As a VC in Steel Sky, I'm the founding partner of that company and I invest in women's healthcare companies. So in Pipeline, it's an angel group, so we're investing um, like $250,000 and $100,000 checks in companies that are in the seed stage and in, in my VC company, I may do a follow-on to a company that I seeded in their angel round. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why you know, I'm excited about my fund and I'm really excited about women's health because I do think that, as Samir said, you um, sometimes get excited about something, sometimes you don't. Sometimes um, I found that my angel investments kept um, steering towards healthcare and specifically women's health because I just really think that there's a huge opportunity in that now. So that's what I'm investing in. I'm a founder. I managed to get a meeting with a VC or an angel. I uh, do the first pitch. Uh, it's the first pitch meeting. It, we're still a long ways away from a term sheet, but I may or may not move to the next round. Uh, for all three of you, uh, the deals that you took on, the founders that have moved on to the next round, just think back to one that was kind of an outlier, a no-brainer, this is a founder, this is a company I want to invest in. What was it about that company? What was it about that founder that compelled you to take it to the next step, to the ultimate, let's say, term sheet? Haley, let's start with you, please. I think beyond the market validation of the science or the technology, um, what brings you from you know point zero to point you know negative one <laughs> is and and sort of back up from there is finding a way to have uh, a relatability to the person on the other side of the table. So um, you know. U.S.-based investors always like to be entertained with some sort of narrative. So they like to know, okay, what is the major shift that's happening in the universe right now, which makes this the only, you know, explanation and the only possible solution to this massive problem we're solving, right? So to have some kind of story that you're telling and, you know, painting this picture in a rainbow of, hey, here enters my product or service that, um, you know, either this market is already... a trillion dollar market or we're building a new one. If the case is that they're building a new market and it's something that doesn't yet exist, how have they in their past life with, you know, domain expertise in the industry kind of proven that they have the ability to do that? Um, so getting to the second meeting is, is not easy and oftentimes you can't really take it personally because the investor, again, you're probably, you know, having meetings with people, again, that aren't investing at your stage or your industry. So if you don't do that research ahead of time, you can't be upset if someone says, hey, we're, you know, we're not going to continue because it's, it's not a win-win-win. Um, so figuring out, okay, if we want to get to the second meeting, first figure out who do you actually want to have the second meeting with? Who do you end up wanting on your cap table? And where can they add value beyond the capital contribution? Samir? Uh, I, I would um, agree with her. In terms of building a relationship, uh, transparency is super important. And so... Um, I often ask for, uh, and it takes a village to get this thing to mm. where it's going to go. And so whether it's uh, existing uh, investors or a potential lead investor, uh, a, an advisor or two, um, uh, great conversations. Like, so this is all geared towards introductions and, and someone who's open and uh, uh, excited to introduce their, um, you know, stakeholders to potential new stakeholders 
shows a certain level of confidence that you know they're on the right path. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I sometimes when you, when people are reluctant to do that, it, it almost seems like they're trying to hide something. So uh, I guess that's all in the spirit of transparency, like making introductions to other potential customers or pilot customers because they're going to want you to succeed. They're not testing your product. Uh, and iterating and giving you feedback because you know they want to waste their time. And so, uh, once and, and if they can give constructive feedback to new potential investors, that's transparent, that's balanced, uh, that's not only cheerleading. Um, that's very helpful during the process. The founders you've invested in, they struck you as upstanding, honest, forthright, and yes. forthcoming yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, I come from the asset management world where. Um, it was possible to actually bet against companies. You can short companies, you can right. buy options against them. In this early stage investing, the only thing you can do is say no. Um, when or not yet. <laughs> <laughs> or not yet, but, um, uh, but there's, there's a lot of um, promotionalism and, and you want to try to create a situation where you're kind of telling the truth, being transparent, and setting up situations where you can over deliver from what you know what you're saying as opposed to creating a bar really high and then disappointing going forward yeah i also think the best time to have conversations with investors is when you're not raising because you know if you just closed an angel round and you go out and have a coffee chat with someone who's you know a great vc this the whole concept of FOMO is, hey, you don't need money right now. Can I give it? When, when can I give it to you? Um, and there's this, there's this saying you all probably heard, when you go out and ask for a check, you get advice. But when you go out and ask for advice, you get a check, right? <laughs> so when you're flexible, when you have runway, when you've got this big cushion and you're, you know, riding clear, then you can go to, you know, someone like one of these guys and say, hey, here's this position I'm in. I'm hitting a real inflection point with my company. I'm hiring all these great people. It's so exciting. Um, you know, and, and maybe, you know, you can be a little bit vulnerable, ask a question. And, hey, if you were sitting in my shoes or when you were a founder, how do, you know, and being, having that open and open and transparent conversation really gives the, um, you know, the, the sort of trajectory of a relationship right. going in the right direction. And, and again, just because you're talking to an investor and they're on the other side of the table does not mean that they are smarter than you. Frankly, a lot of, most of you are experts in, you know, whatever niche vertical you're sort of targeting. Um, and again, just because someone can write a check does not mean that they're the best person to do it. So figuring out, you know, almost dating and go, you know, having these little conversations when you're not strapped for cash. And again, the best time to do that is when you have a little bit of runway so you can have, you know, have a smooth sailing conversation. Gotcha. Maria, same question, but slightly different. As a founder, what was the pitch that you delivered that you were like, nailed it? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think it's when you really begin to craft your story. It takes a while to perfect your story. You may start with something and then realize it doesn't quite resonate. And so I think it's really important to understand who you're talking to, what investments they've done in the past, what's important to them, how do you align or fit with their thesis, or how do you not? And like um, you said, definitely, you should not be wasting time pitching people that you don't align to their thesis. So when people come to me and it's a man, two men, I'm like, okay, why are you coming to me? Doesn't, you know I only invest in women, I invest in healthcare, so it looks bad that you didn't do your research that you're reaching out to me. Okay. If you were reaching out to me and you were saying, you know, I have a, a specific healthcare solution for women's health that I think you'll be excited about, then I'll be interested and write back and then we can start a dialogue. But if you're coming to me and you're in FinTech and you have a team of you know, two men, then that doesn't make sense. So I think really the best conversations are the ones that people were excited about me before I even got there yeah. because they understood what I was doing, they bought into my idea, and I didn't really have to sell it. I just kind of confirmed and we had a conversation to see if it was a fit. And so those are the, the best ones. Uh, as on the investor side, I look for two main things. Does the team match the product or solution? Does it make sense? Are you a fintech person who's starting like a brain surgery company? Does that make sense? I don't, I don't know if you're the best founder for that company. And then number two, knowing your financials, your unit economics. If a founder can come in and tell me their CAC, LTV, like their unit economics, I'm impressed. Because a lot of people come and I ask them about their revenue models and they're like, oh, well, this is a game-changing idea. And I'm like, okay, great. Uh, 
what are the margins and how are you going to make money and what does that look like? Is it a subscription service? Is it, if they don't know that yet, then I don't even know that you have a viable company and you don't know that you have a viable company. If you can't tell me what your total, total addressable market is, how do we know how much money that you can make? You might be better off, you know, working at Google as a, you know, as a developer rather than, you know, starting this company. So to be able to tell me your total addressable market, your unit economics, I think that's key to getting to the next round. We have a question in Slido I'd like for all three of you to tackle. Uh, it gets down to brass stacks. How much do angels get in that initial investment in terms of equ equity? Amir? Yeah, look, I, I, I speak, too much, uh, yeah. I, I speak um, an only anecdotally. Uh, I am a member in two you know, pretty active uh, angel groups in, in, in the New York area. I would say garden variety first check, uh, you know, is 25K, but that can, I've, I've seen some go up as high as 100, you know, and um, and then obviously if you have a super angel, which, you know, it's obviously tough to find, it could be even bigger than that. Uh, but uh, I think that's just anecdotally what I've seen. Yeah. Maria? It varies depending on the organization. Like Samir said, I'm a part of a pipeline angels and our checks could range from 50 to 250. Um, as an individual angel, sometimes 50. It really depends. So the valuation depends on how much of the company that you actually own after the investment. But uh, you're most likely you're not going to get more than like 250 um, from an angel. Right. And I think the key is whatever that number is, even if it's a smaller portion of a bigger pie, that's really the goal. So, um, A, you know, assuring that the person you're giving equity to deserves it because they're going to give you something beyond the check um, in return, A, and B, you know, really understanding that uh, if they are going to be someone that take, gets you to your Series A or gets you to Series B, if there's a negotiation there, um, you know, with a few basis points at, at, at the beginning of the conversation, it's really a, a give and take depending on what is uh, the value that they can provide post this investment. Well, let's stay with you on that one then. Um, what are some of the must-haves uh, from a startup uh, to meet your criteria, and what are some of the hard passes that you guys have made. And I'm going to, uh, I'd love for all three of you to answer that. But Halo, let's start with you. Yeah, so I think one of the things I touched on a little bit earlier and when it comes back to founder team and founder company fit is if you have not been around the block in this industry um, and have, you know, done it once or twice before or can call up, you know, a, a dear friend who is, you know, somewhat senior and, and you know, a big corporate that's a big decision maker you know what i mean if if you're going into this for the first time and you're the founder of casper and you're starting a um you know a, a biotech company there is something that doesn't quite fit there so what is a must have a must have is uh you know a real uh display of having been successful in doing something similar um in their past life. And again, that often is, hey, I've been, you know, at in sort of three different sectors of the industry and I've had um, relationships here, here and here and I've experienced this pain point personally. Having some real drive to say, I'm going to take this to fruition no matter what. When it comes down to that grit or that tenacity or whatever little factors we talk about, <clears throat> That only matters if you are actually going to stay there and, and be with the company until, um, you know, through through the longevity of it. So what is a must have? You know, that smell, I feel like it's like my 18th sense is like, is this person really, you know, going to back up what they're saying? Are they going to go walk the walk or are they just really excited right here and right now, but are going to go flip the business, you know, if any chance they get. So really drilling deep into the motivation. So if they have, you know, a lot of our founders, they have been building the concept of their business for their entire lives. Like it, you know, it has been something that they were sort of raised with or born with or their family had, or, you know, it was, it's not something that they'll get bored of and one day say, I'm, you know, I'm kind of over it. So, you know, a must have is can, you know, do you want to do it? can you do it and will you do it and a must have is other great people around the table so if you see hey here's this cap table of you know a bunch of folks that maybe aren't you know in in the real industry or they were all writing token checks you know figuring out who else is the supporter because 
it takes a village. No one investor can take a company to fruition. No one founder can do it on their own. It all is about like, you know, a driving force towards what is, you know, the future of the industry. So, you know, those, that real, uh, that real drive to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere is, is very important to me. Gotcha. Maria, let's jump, jump to Maria. Would you, if you don't mind, what are some of the must haves and some, some of the hard passes that you've made? So must haves, like I said before, is the team needs a coachable founder. Mm -hmm. So I'll get pitched from a founder and they're, you know, I'll question some of their assumptions. And if they're giving me defensiveness and they're not being receptive to feedback, this is not a founder that I would want to work with and have in my portfolio because when the going gets tough, sometimes you do need to pivot. And a founder needs to be flexible and open and be able to identify opportunities and know when to hold them and know when to fold them and to pivot to something new. So if I don't believe that you have the self-awareness or judgment to do that, then I will be a hard pass. Um, the second thing is, again, not knowing your numbers. Uh, it just means that you may be really excited about this product, but maybe you're not the best person to run this business. And I found a lot of people with great products but they're not the ones that are going to create the billion dollar company around this product. And that's also really um, disheartening for me because it's sometimes I really believe in a product, but I don't believe in the founder. Mm -hmm. And that's a, definitely a hard pass. Yeah, I've heard stories about, like that. Samir? Yeah. Um, I, there's many must haves. I'll focus on one, and she's touched on it pretty well, is just the financial projection. So obviously, it, look, I'm, I'm coming from uh, a background where uh, you know I, I like to see projections, but th the purpose at this early stage is not to hold you to these numbers, and th they're all going to be a hockey stick at some point. It's just how early that happens, uh, but it's uh, you would never pitch to an investor without an investor deck. Um, uh, you'd be surprised how many startups have investor decks and very nicely prepared, you know, qualitative materials, but like literally no quantitative materials. And um, there's a lot of help around. Like, uh, frankly, I, I, if it's not even there, like I'm happy to work with you and, and put something together or find someone to help you put something together because it literally is another version of your deck. It's just people that read a different language need to see how the numbers work and, and the economics and the margins and all that going forward. And it's a good way to get in your mind of how this thing will eventually scale so it doesn't matter whether it's month 11 or month 36 when it starts going hockey stick. No one cares about that. No one's going to hold you to that monthly number. It's more to get in your brain to work out the analytics of how this business works. Um, so getting uh, reasonable projections uh, in place and sharing them with the early investor is a very important part of the process. Gotcha. Um, for all three of you, and let's start with Haley, um, what are... Like, what's the most important, impressive advice that you've shared with a founder that was a bit of a game changer for them, for their business? They perhaps came back to you and said, wow, that really helped. Or perhaps you patted yourself on the back later that night and said, wow, I did really well. Was there a situation like that? What advice did you give them? Give it to us, please. Yeah, I think founders are so busy building their companies that sometimes they forget to develop an infrastructure around themselves and really supporting, uh, you know, their own, you know, Life. mental, physical, emotional, yeah. like, so you know, future. Mm -hmm. So I always figure that, you know, it's really important not only to have the board of directors of your company, but your personal board of directors. So who do you uh, sort of lean on, whether it be other founders or other investors that don't have a stake or, um, you know, or a, or a mentor or an advisor? It, you can't do this without asking for help. So one of the most important things I say is, you know, you should not be timid about, you know, being a little bit uh, vulnerable in certain situations because you can't get on you know, the center stage at TechCrunch unless you have had other people, you know, do some favors and pull some strings and, and get you to where you need to be. So one of the ways I, you know, always recommend doing that is, is often having founder friends, like, you know, looking to the right and left, uh, you know, of, to yourself in this room, which is, okay, we are all, you know, fighting the good fight. And we're going through some of the same struggles. So can maybe you introduce me to one of your investors or we find a way to, you know, you know, double up on an accelerator or an incubator 
program or whatever it may be, but, you know, figuring out, okay, uh, you know, the, whether the numbers are there or, and, um, again, you know, I think a little bit differently about, um, about sort of quantitative elements when I am, uh, I am sort of screening an investment opportunity, but the one thing I do say is, A, you know, raise more if you can at this point in time because we're, you know, the next two years are uh, really unknown. There's a lot of geopolitical risk. There's a lot of, uh, you know, socioeconomic sort of madness. You know, in two years, there could literally be, you know, bricks falling from the sky. I, you know, no one has any idea. So, you know, what every market, there's, you know, an impending market correction. There's a lot of unknowns. So, you know, two things is, A, you know, get yourself a squad that's going to help support you through thick and thin. And B, you know, really figure out your capital raise strategy so you're not running out of money and that you can be strategic for selecting the types of investors that you want to work with and not the other way around and having to beg when you, you know, have one month of runway left. That's huge. Yeah. Selecting the investors you want to work with rather than the other way around. That's huge. Samir? Um, I, I guess, uh, hearkening back to the financial stuff, I guess I've helped um, companies interview controllers, accounting people to put the models together to get to the VC stage. Um, I think that's important at some point to bring that in. Um, um, yeah, that's it, I guess. Maria? So the best advice I gave to a founder, they didn't take, and then they came back and told me that they should have, and that was that it was time to sell their business. So some founders want to continue to run their business, you know, through eternity, but that's not the reality for most businesses. Most um, investors want an eventual exit, but also if you don't take on an investor, you just need to understand the life cycle of your product or service that's in the market. So it's usually going to go up and then you're going to get more competition and then it's going to start to decline. We had a meeting when they were just, you know, kind of peaking and it was, they were just seeing the first signs. And I said, you know what, this might be an opportunity for you to sell your business, get some value, start another business, or become an investor, and, and they chose not to. And so then the uh, past two years, their, build, their business has declined, and now all of that value that they had made over the last five years is wiped out because they were trying to, to double down, double down, and save their business. That once your business is in a downturn and a cycle like that, it's just, it's just where it is. And so to be aware enough and to accept that your business isn't always going to be on the uptick and to know when to sell, when to move on, or when to raise more money um, is important. So. There's a concept called willful blindness, and right. us founders are extremely susceptible to it. Interesting question in Slido. Uh, how do you guys feel about founder salaries at this early stage? And let's go run the panel. Haley? So I work out of the Barclays Innovation Office over on uh, 23rd Street, and you see, you know, sort of just this buzzing energy of all these early stage fintech companies. And, uh, and then when it comes down to it and you really, you know, start talking, it's like, okay, well, you're living on like, you know, $40,000 a year and some token equity no matter where you came from. So you know, I look at the series A and B level, but I've seen, you know, crazy models at, you know, the seed level, especially if it's a serial entrepreneur, they're maybe going to their third or fourth business and they think that they can justify paying themselves a, you know, a $300,000 salary and, you know, at the seed stage, that's just, that is a red flag. Um, so, you know, what do I do when I'm evaluating it? It's not necessarily, okay, is there, you know, what is in the the one side, the one dollar sign, or the you know a two dollar sign? Um, the nitty gritty is is less important, but is it aligned with the company stage? Quite simply. Yeah, Samir. Yeah, I think it's kind of you 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 know it when you you when you see it. I mean, clearly there's a practical reality to it, and people need to earn an income. And so I'm not uh, against obviously salaries at pre seed and seed uh, to the extent the capital is, is there. Um, when we get a little bit further um, and you're pitching to other investors, we, you're going to put in the salaries anyway. So like seeing financial projections that have no salaries is not that helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether we have the capital to, to do that now or not, we should always bake that in. So I, I come from the viewpoint that uh, I, w I, I invest only assuming like, you know, salaries, a reasonable salary. Now, look, it is early stage and everyone needs to sacrifice a little bit, uh, but there's no scenario where I think it's reasonable where there's no salaries at all, so. Nice, yeah. Maria? 
Mm. Yeah. So only bad salary is no salary because then we can't really understand how much it costs to run your business if you don't have your salary. At the early seed, I say between 50 and like 85. That's typical for what we see. I wouldn't really want to see anything above 100K unless your business is like making a ton of money already. But most of the time when it's not in your pre-revenue, I would it would be a red flag if you were trying to make more than six figures. Nice. Uh, Samir, I want to throw this question to you. It's from Slido. Um, what method of valuation do you want to see for a pre-revenue startup? So what methodology do you use to evaluate these numbers? Um, uh, literally, at, at this level, it, it's almost 99% art. Uh, so it is based on uh, the, the, the Wall Street will tell you it's 50% art and 50% science. But at this stage, it's all... Uh, it's all art, um, and you, 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 you get relative data points just from the market, obviously. Um, I, I would say, like, if, look, if it's just an idea and, and, a, and a deck, uh, the, the analytical way to differentiate is just, like, how far along you are at this early stage. So uh, if it's an idea and a deck, maybe it's, like, a million pre. Who knows? And if it's an MVP and... You know, you have a lot of data points in the market. It could maybe be a five million pre. Who knows? But like, um, uh, there, it's all art. There's no, there's no science. It, it, in fact, I, uh, I know it, the market doesn't work that way. But essentially, it's just how much uh, equity uh, you guys want to give away. I mean, that, that it's it, the valuation literally is an output. It's not mm -hmm. like it's, it, it's not a. Uh, a, pro, a proactive like input variable, in, in my in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it, if, if the angel's going to provide a lot of help, and you think they're going to be proactively introduce you to things and help you shape your business, um, the valuation will just be an uh, output in terms of how much equity plus like options or whatever you give that person, right? So. And have you taken board seats in your startups? Um, I. Uh, I guess technically, I'm, I'm, I like to be active, and so it would be like advisory board. I, 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 some of these early stage businesses don't necessarily have formal boards. Mm -hmm. They're not C corps, I think. Um, right. But uh, yeah, I, I like the, the practical effect of trying to be a sounding board for the founders that I try to back for sure. Nice. And uh, Maria, how uh, how much do you stay involved with the uh, founders that you invest in? I'm very active. I am only investing in founders in the space that I know very well, that I'm very well connected. So I'm pretty active. The founders usually check in like every two weeks or something. I'll work with them and they'll know that if somebody quits or if they need to work through a business problem, they can call me and I'll come in and give them an hour or two of my time and, and we'll think through that together. Um, again, I'm invested in their success and so I'm willing to do that. A lot of people are a little passive, especially angels and angel groups. They may, you know, just invest along with the group and they just are waiting for their returns. Other people that, you know, have more time and want to be more involved will be more active, but it really depends on who that person is or who the angel group is. So that's another point for you guys to think about when you're taking money, how active do you want the, the people involved and to understand what that is ahead of time so that there's no false expectations. Nice. And we're approaching on the hour, so we'll slowly wind down. Uh, I'll throw this last question to all three of you. We'll take it down the panel like this. Uh, what kind of founders are you hoping to meet tonight, Haley? Let's see. There's a couple uh, industry areas that I'm hunting for. Uh -huh. One is disruption of the food system in general. So everything from like ag tech to supply chain to food, not you know not seamless type food delivery. There's going to be some transaction happening with seamless soon. I think, as I've been hearing about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, ag tech, biometrics, and what was my other one? <laughs> oh, and audio tech, audio, and tech. audio tech. Gotcha. Interesting, Samir. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a generalist, so I'm I'm. If you're passionate about your business and uh, can explain it eloquently, that's that's what I want to see. <laughs> okay. 
And I'm looking for any female founders. And this isn't a guy who's married, and so you're saying, oh, my wife gets 50% anyway. I get those a lot. So I'm looking for females who have innovative ideas in healthcare. Um, I was just informed we actually have 10 more minutes, so yay. Um, um, Maria, um, how do you, being a founder, being an investor, angel, um, and I'm not asking just from your personal experience. I'm sort of asking you to aggregate from what you've seen out there. Um, how do you balance personal life and work life? We know that founders, entrepreneurs, are just insane workaholics. Yeah. So I imagine you're in a different, yeah. and I imagine you see a lot of similar stuff. So any advice for those of us who can't quite hack it in both uh, spheres? Well, I mean, there really is no work-life balance, and that's what you have to know when you're an entrepreneur. It's all on you, especially if you start taking other people's money. You have a lot of pressure, a lot of expectations. You have to put food on the table for the people that work for you. So I really found that it was a 24-7. I didn't have much work-life balance, um, so that's why I was happy when I got to the exit, because then I could finally take a breath. But I just know as an entrepreneur and as entrepreneurs out there, I could say all day long, oh, you need to take some me time or stuff. But at the end of the day, you're trying to grind and get this business going, and there's just not enough time in the day. So you just have to realize that you're going to be sacrificing and giving up uh, a lot of your time. Gotcha. <laughs> um, Haley, this one's for you. Most of the deal flow that comes through your door, um, I assume the startups are New York-based? Um, not not necessarily. Not strictly. Are they registered in Delaware? Yes. We won't invest in a company if it's not a Delaware C Corp at, at the Series A level. Is there a particular... Well, unless, unless it's an international company and they have a different registration, but something that equates to a Delaware C Corp. Why is Delaware so successful at being Delaware? You know, I really don't know the answer to that. That was something I learned so early on that was just like... Avoid LLCs, avoid LLCs. But there were, I, didn't, I should ask that question to my superiors because now, now I'm curious. Do you as know? A, yeah, as a former lawyer, I know <laughs> that um, the corporate law system and common law system in Delaware has just developed over a long period of time, and their, legis their government um, supports that. And so um, they have a, the most long, I guess the longest established, there's precedent for a lot of these you know, investor-type conflicts that can come up in the, in the future where other jurisdictions, it's just, you know, since no one's incorporated there, they don't have that body of law to, like, support, you know, comfort in knowing how, like, outcomes are going to be if you get into a dispute. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've covered a lot of these. Hmm. How are deals with angels structured? Samir, could you uh, speak to that a little bit? How are deals with angel structures? Uh, get uh, into a bit of a nitty gritty. Um, they're incorporated in Delaware. Well, uh, uh, I think I think most of the stuff I see is either it's um, so. Look, there's some people that have hard and fast rules that they won't invest in anything other than a C corp, uh, mm. uh, a corporation, and that's fine. And I understand that because there's governance and and all the protections, you, know, you can get the most protections as an investor if it's a C-Corp. Um, but early stage investing is, you know, I'm uh, sorry, uh, being an entrepreneur of an early stage company, it's, I mean, it's more expensive, obviously, to do that. So I see safes and I see converts and there's a lot of complexities that go into all that. But uh, for me, like, I, I, the biggest variable, no matter what the structure is, just what the valuation is. And mm -hmm. um, in the safe and convert area, it's a valuation cap, and, and, and in the convert, I'm uh, sorry, in the C Corp, it's just a straight, you know, valuation, and that's where I mostly focus, but. Mm -hmm. um, and just in case you don't know what a cert is in a safe, so it's a convert, it's a convertible note and a safe. So these are documents, if you don't want to set the valuation of your company at this time, you can kind of kick that can down the road and mm -hmm give a, um, like a valuation cap. So, okay, we're saying that we don't know exactly what the valuation is, but it's not going to be more than, you know, $6 million or something like that. It's just to set a cap, and then you can figure out the valuation at the next round. Mm -hmm. And if you're bold enough, you go and raise an uncapped round, which <laughs> most investors will say, heck no, but right. 
but yeah, uh, in, cer in certain cases, if it's, if it's you know, a, a deal that you can't pass on, then you gotta do what you gotta do. Hmm. Gotcha. Um, the, um, the convertible note, uh, I believe you can take the money today and you have 15 days. Correct me if I'm wrong, Samir, you have a law background. Um, you have 15 days to do all the paperwork, but you can use money right away. Isn't that right? Um, I, I think the convert uh, enables you, like, uh, you don't have to set the valuation today. It is a, it's, in my opinion, it's, as an investor, it's better than a safe just because you know technically, theoretically, after two years you can ask for your money back, but uh, that's not the purpose of entering into these kinds of things. Um, <laughs> Uh, also, there's an interest rate that essentially accrues in more equity over some period of time. So, um, okay. um, I would say yeah, as Maria. far as spending the money right away, most of the time in the contracts, there'll be some kind of a minimum threshold. So if your raise is $500,000, I'm going to say, I'm not giving you a check until you've gotten to two fifty, dollars Or I may right. say, I'm not giving you a check until you're done with the round because I don't want my money just sitting there and then you take eight more years to raise the rest of the money. So most of the time, contracts will have some kind of a minimum or mm -hmm. they'll have it in there of when you actually can start spending the money. Investors have a wonderful French word for it. They call it the tranche. <laughs> um, uh, Maria, question for you from the audience. Um, how do you feel about uh, triple F rounds as you know, founders, uh, friends, families, and oh. fools? How do you pe <laughs> feel about um, uh, founders that come in with some pre-investment? I think it's great. It means that you're somebody that people like. I think it says a lot about you if you have that. Not everyone, especially females and minorities, they don't have friends and family with like rich uncles that can just write checks. So at Pipeline Angels, we see ourselves as that friend and family around for, for those individuals. Um, but I think it says a lot about you. If you get that, it means people believe in you. It means you must be trustworthy because these are people in your personal network who have known you for years that are investing in you. So I think it speaks highly. Mm-hmm. Understood, yeah. Um, okay, um, what can we conclude from this conversation? Well, I was really fascinated by what you said, Haley, um, about American investors being narrative driven. I wonder if uh, perhaps international investors are less so narrative driven. Are, are you saying that? It depends on yeah. the type of investor and right. exactly where they came from. But from my generalize. personal experience over the past um, couple of years, I'd say, is that we have the priorities are just ordered a little bit differently. And it's not to say that mm -hmm. U.S. investors are not looking at the quantitative elements of your pitch or your projections. Um, but again, they're expecting not only do you have to have the meat of the business, everything has to be there, but you also have to, like, please me and make me love you, right? So it's not that... It's not that other investors don't want that. It's just that they're not expecting a whole song and dance, whereas U.S. investors are saying, we need everything and that much more. Because when you're pitching to a, you know, a tier one VC, you know, I mean, even, no matter what it is, like we, we even see 3,000 deals a year. So what matters is that you're memorable. And again, there's a lot of uh, noise and, you know, so, so much uh, competition and there's so many different factors. So again, not only do you have to have a phenomenal business, a perfect team, a flawless go-to-market and a revenue model that's better than anyone else's, but you have to, you know, make me feel like I'm like watching a, you know, a, you know, yeah. the, the next Oscar film or something like that. Like it, it is kind of crazy that that's the expectation, but it's only because, you know, your peers have set such a crazy high standard for um, what it means. And, you know, and there's certain, you know, accelerator programs that bring in the coaches from TED Talk to just, you know, hone in on what is that one word or that one hook or that one, you know, uh, hand motion or item of delivery that's going to give the investor the aha moment. Mm -hmm. But again, they're just expecting it. Uh, they're just expecting you to, like, blow them out of the water. And, and mm -hmm. you, on top of everything else, you still have to you know, make them Great smile. point. Great note to hang on to. Um, um, 
This is going to be a last question, everybody. Yeah. The question was, what was the sort of a worst thing you've seen in the pitch? I was trying to avoid that question really hard. Uh, I don't want them to put anybody well, no, it's, on it's, blast. It doesn't have to be specific. It doesn't have to be specific. Uh, Does anybody have a good story to end uh, well, uh, the in, evening on? Just from pattern recognition, people will say, when I get the money, I'll start to build this. Mm. And that's just a big old no-no because people are, you know, building things out of sticks and stones and literally from the ground up and with nothing there. So if you're saying, oh, I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs and waiting to build a business yeah. until you write me a check, that's a terrible signal. But again, it's not to say that you actually mean that, but sometimes when you say that, um, again, everything, every one little word or phrase, again, can be the difference between, you know, a lead investor or a uh, blacklist. And again, when you have such a, you know, strong rooted thing to say, oh, I'm, you know, you know, I, I don't even need that or I, I'm going to wait until I have my money and I'm safe and then I'll start building. That's a little bit of a no-no. And the other thing is when we were back to this point about size of the round and market optics, if someone says I'm raising, you know, a 2 million series A to me, I'm saying, you know, have you been sleeping for the past 10 years? Because that was like less than an average series A, mm. you know, way back then. So figuring out how do you, you know, catch on to what everyone else is doing. And again, on top of building a business, you have to be aware of, yeah. you know, the rest of the market and, and how it's turning. But, um, you know, those two things being so certain, I'm closing the round and, you know, next month, hey, that's never going to happen if, if you don't have it all committed right now and the legal docs are filed. So, um, you know, timing is everything. So, you know. Nice. Well, there you go. Don't do that. <laughs> all right. Uh, guys, let's thank our panelists tonight. You guys were wonderful. Thank you so much.